Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Electricity Wildfire, Wildfire Mitigation Webinar Series. We are pleased to have all of you here with us today. I'm Meredith Brasselman with ICF, and our team is going to be guiding you through the webinar today, as well as next week's final webinar in this series. First, as always, we have a few housekeeping items. We have muted your lines upon entry, and they will remain muted during the duration of the webinar. So please note that this webinar call is being recorded and live streamed on DOE's YouTube channel. It will be posted on the Department of Energy's website and may be used internally. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the call. If you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera and participate by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed consent to recording and use of your voice or image. If you have technical issues today or questions, please type them in the chat box and select to send to the host. We are going to start our discussion today with a quick poll. We would like to know if prior to today's webinar, have you talked to a DOE or a national lab representative about technologies to help mitigate wildfires? You can see the poll in the, the polling function, and if you can just answer yes or no, that would be great. And then we're going to continue with some of our housekeeping items. So we are going to be taking questions today. You may submit your questions throughout the presentations, but we're going to hold them until the end. So please submit your questions in the chat and select host from the drop down menu. Please also reference either the speaker's name or the topic when you submit your questions so we can ask the correct panelist at the end of our conversation today. And finally, if you need to view live captioning, please refer to the link that will appear in the chat panel. So to get us started today, please welcome Vanessa Chan, Chief Commercialization Officer and Director of the Office of Technology Transitions at DOE. Vanessa. Thanks for joining us today for this third installment in the Department of Energy's Wildfire Webinar Series. If you tuned into parts one and two, you heard from Pat Hoffman and Michael Pezen in the Office of Electricity, as well as a host of our experts on some of the technologies and tools the department can bring to bear on the challenges posed by wildfires. Through these stories, you got a detailed look at how our national laboratories, the crown jewels of DOE Science Enterprise, apply their talents to solving real world problems. As Chief Commercialization Officer and Director of the Office of Technology Transitions, OTT, my focus is on translating the work that our labs do into impact in the real world. We help our labs conceive and find potential applications for their technologies. Then we connect them with the industry partners and innovators who can add their expertise to bring this new solution to market. OTT fulfills its mission to expand the commercial impact of the research investments of the department in three strategic areas. First, we create deployable R&D. By funding programs like our Technology Commercialization Fund and equipping lab researchers with the skills they need to grow an entrepreneurial mindset through our Energy I Corps Bootcamp program. Second, we catalyze regional innovation with our EPIC Prize, which helps incubators and accelerators build stronger ecosystem across the lab to market chain. Finally, we support industry verticals through tools like our lab partnering service, which you can find at labpartnering.org where you can instantly tap into the sum of our national lab expertise with just a keyword search. And this is just a small sample of how our office engages up and down the commercialization ladder. It's part of our promise to the American people to transform research into reality in the fight to secure our climate future, provide good paying jobs and ensure access to clean, affordable, reliable energy for all of us. We are far from the only agency or organization developing technologies to tackle wildfires. Instead, our labs engage with partners from every corner to support this effort and deliver solutions that can make a difference. To do this requires keeping three things front and center when it comes to effective technology commercialization. First, expand your aperture. You may be developing a technology to solve one problem, but are there other problems that you can solve with it? If you're creative and look for opportunities, you can go from modeling power systems for distributed energy to building tools that can keep the lights on when the grid is under threat. Second, engage and align the ecosystem or stakeholders early. You need the support of everyone from conception to implementation or the technology will languish on the bench. 
No single organization can drive impact on their own. You need an ecosystem. Third, and something you don't see in the success stories, but you would behind the scenes, is to call it quits sooner rather than later if a technology is not working. There's no shame in stopping a project and the nature of R&D is such that some things just won't work. Get into a growth mindset and ask yourself, what did you learn from this not working? It's not a failure, it's an experiment with a result you didn't expect, and that is okay, stop and move on. The three labs you'll hear from today have built analytical tools that are ready, or almost ready, to go to bat for the agencies, organizations, and businesses that work to keep people safe when a wildfire strikes. Argonne National Labs Wildfire Threat Model integrates wildfire hazards with power and telecommunications infrastructure to predict what critical services will be disrupted or lost. This helps utilities prepare and protect their strategic assets and preserve communication lifelines. Sandia National Labs deployed its Stanford Standard Unified Modeling Mapping and Integration Toolkit, Summit, for use by the California Fire and Rescue Training Authority to help agencies in their response to emergency scenarios, including wildfires and other public emergency events. And finally, Slack is working with labs and industry to develop and deploy tools to anticipate, handle, and recover from extreme events. The Grid Resilience and Intelligent Platform, GRIP, uses machine learning and artificial intelligence to predict grid events and reduce recovery time by managing distributed energy resources, even when communications are limited. These powerful tools offer a glimpse of what's possible when our labs create partnerships and apply their world-class talent and facilities to solve problems that affect us all. OTT exists to further this mission. And the earlier we recognize the inherent possibility in a scientific breakthrough, the quicker we can support researchers and the innovation community in bringing it to life. Once again, thank you for joining us today for this small but critical slice of our lab's incredible capabilities. And I hope you'll continue to connect with us as you tackle new technical challenges down the road. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. So now it's time to hear from our colleagues at the National Labs. Today we will hear from Edgar Portante, Feng Xu, Jim Kuiper, and Ian Hyde from Argonne National Laboratory, Russell Gale, Leo Bynum, and Richard Burnoff from Sandia National Laboratories, and Alona Tiber from SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. A reminder that you are welcome to put your questions in the chat as we go through today. Please select to send to the host and we're going to hold your questions till the end. So please submit your questions. When you submit your questions, please also include either the speaker's name or the topic. So let's dive deeper into mo the modeling and analytical tools provided by Argonne National Laboratory. We are pleased to welcome Edgar Portante from Argonne to discuss its probabilistic wildfire threat model for electric systems. Edgar. Oh. Uh, we can hear you now, Edgar. Oh, wonderful. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, the webinar this afternoon. Again, my name is Edgar Portante of ARIA National Laboratory, and I would like to talk about the ongoing project. In fact, we just started this project uh, named Probabilistic Wildfire Threat Model for Electric System. Uh, next slide, please. So the basic purpose of this um, model is to provide uh, stakeholders, uh, utilities, it should be uh, DOE or Argon, the ability to assess the risks posed by wildfires to electric power systems. It has four uh, basic functions. The first uh, is given the high level description of the scenario, it is the location, uh, location of the fire or time of the month of the year, or even the size of the fire, it is going to evaluate the possible occurrence of wildfire in the region of interest. Secondly, it's going to generate what we call fragility curves, or sometimes we call these damage functions, uh, to be used to determine the damage levels of electric assets that are within the wildfire perimeter. And thirdly, uh, it's going to generate a list of possible at-risk electric assets that will serve as input to Argonne's uh, probabilistic grid simulator. 
how we call this uh, EPFAS. So EPFAS is an important component of this overall uh, risk uh, model. Uh, EPFAS is a special load flow program that calculates the load loss due to an event and also um, does uh, economic production uh, calculations. And lastly, <clears throat> the model is going to assess the impacts of the removal of the affected or damaged electric assets on the grid performance using the Monte Carlo uh, technique. And the measure of impact on the end is in terms of the expected load loss, a different probability, a probability level, and also the power flow rerouting of the case chosen as a solution and changes in the economic dispatch uh, or the cost of uh, rescheduling the generation dispatch. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the approach or the architecture uh, of the model. Uh, others might call this the input-output uh, diagram. So the main input of the model is what we call the stochastic uh, wildfire occurrence function or the wildfire probability heat maps. And the one that you see here was developed actually by the University of California Merced uh, model. Now each of the cell in this heat map has a probability of fire ignition and we can use that to establish whether there's fire or not in each of the cells in this heat map. So the first step in the, <clears throat> in the modeling process is to do a random sampling of the stochastic uh, fire probability function to see whether there's fire or not in that specific cell in the heat map. If there's fire in that cell, then all electric assets that are contained in that cell will be assumed uh, damaged and they will be removed from the system. So this changes the topology of the system. After that, we are going to review the status of the system and see which other component of the system will be on outage due to forced uh, outage rates. So we will do another random sampling of the FORs uh, and examine which ones are going to be out due to force out its rates. So we have changed the topology of the system in, in two ways. First, we removed those that were damaged by the wildfire. And secondly, we removed those that were <clears throat> uh, forced out its rates. And then we have the final topology or configuration of the system. Then we input this into EPFAST, which is our grid simulator. And EPFAST then is going to simulate the revised system and calculate the load loss. So that's the uh, first iteration of the, of the model. And the model is going to repeat this 2,000 times as part of the Monte Carlo uh, calculation uh, framework. And after that, it's going to generate uh, graphs and tables that will be used to assess the uh, uh, the reliability of the system and the impact of the wildfire. The uh, re recommended approach here is first to run this uh, without the wildfire event and then run it a second time with the probability occurrence of the wildfire. All right, next slide, please. Now, in terms of the uh, input, we have four categories of input for this model. We have the fire ignition probability heat maps, and then we have the fragility curves, and then the electric infrastructure layer, and lastly, the historical wildfire uh, progression maps. For the fire ignition uh, probability heat maps, uh, we are currently concentrating on three uh, indices the U University of California Merced index that I've described uh, before and the, uh, the case Brian uh, drought index and also the fire danger index. Now each of these indices can be related to fire activities and each of the cells of their heat maps has a fire probability value for potentially starting a fire. The fragility curves, uh, we're going to have uh, two kinds. We have the probabilistic damage function and the other is a simple one, which is the binary uh, damage function. Uh, for now, we are using the binary damage function. It simply says 
that if an asset is within the fire zone, then we will assume it to be non-functioning and it will be damaged. If it is out of the fire zone, then it is still functioning. The uh, probabilistic damage function is uh, the one shown here on the right. It is a, a curve that shows the probability of failure of an asset given the uh, fire intensity underneath or around that asset. Uh, the third input is, of course, the electric infrastructure layer. Uh, we can have regional or local or any size of uh, electric systems to be simulated. And then the third, and then the fourth is the historical wildfire progression map. So we're going to uh, collect uh, historical wildfire events and uh, <clears throat> Uh, also, their wildfire uh, patterns and wildfire intensities, and this will be used by the scenario creator to anchor uh, the characteristics of the event, uh, especially the size uh, of the fire. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in terms of the output, uh, this is the first output of the model. It's going to uh, output. Uh, five graphs that can be used to visually uh, assess the impact of the wildfire uh, before the wildfire and during the wildfire. So the first of this graph is the <clears throat> load loss scatter diagram. Uh, it's simply the plot of the load losses uh, versus the number of iterations. So here you can see about 2,000 points uh, plotted uh, on this diagram. So if you run this, uh, if you have a pre-event run, you will see uh, uh, the yellow or the orange line there, they call the average uh, expected load loss. And then you can also run, uh, assuming there is a fire event, you can see, you can compare the scatter diagram uh, before the event and during the event, you can see that the expected average uh, load loss is, uh, is higher. The other lines there are <clears throat> lines uh, indicating one standard deviation above the average, and one standard deviation below the average. The other graph uh, that is uh, generated automatically is the load loss or megawatt loss frequency distribution graph. It's simply uh, a plot of the load loss and uh, the number of occurrence that it has over the 2,000 iterations of the Monte Carlo. So this also, you can compare the shape of this uh, frequency distribution map uh, before the event and during the event, you can see the difference uh, visually on the shape of the curves. Uh, the third, I think that's the most important is the load loss exceedance curve, uh, which shows the, the probability of hitting or exceeding the uh, certain amount of load loss in the system. Oftentimes, uh, we are interested in trying to see what is the probability of heating or exceeding the average uh, load loss. And we want to, to look at those probabilities and compare it, what happens if there's fire? Would the probability of exceeding that loss increase or not? The other uh, graphs include the megawatt loss probability distribution curve, which is similar actually to the frequency distribution graph. And the last one is the load loss, cumulative probability distribution curve, which is kind of the reverse of the megawatt loss exceedance curve. Again, uh, you, can, you can compare the shape of these curves uh, before the event and after the event and see how the fire has impacted the reliability of your system. Next slide, please. Uh, also, we have developed uh, seven indices uh, that we thought was going to help assess the reliability of the system. Uh, this indices would allow uh, the comparison of the systems uh, before and during the wildfire event. Now, in this table, uh, system one uh, could represent the, the system prior to the wildfire event, and system two could represent the, uh, the same system but during the fire event. And you can see that uh, <clears throat> there is uh, an increase in, in value of these indices uh, before and during the event. Uh, the first index here uh, is the expected average uh, load loss. And, uh, <clears throat> and the second is the 
expected average load loss as a percent of total system loss. And I think that's an important value. Uh, and the third is the probability of exceeding the average uh, load loss for the system. You can see that before and after and during the event, it has uh, increased tremendously. If you take the ratio of that, then you can see um, the degree by which the system has deteriorated because of the fire. Now, these seven indices, uh, we discovered that the first three are the most important and very consistent in terms of measuring uh, the impact of the wildfire. The items number four, five, and six, and seven, um, the ratio, sometimes they don't really indicate uh, uh, the degree of the impact, and it's a case-to-case -case basis. So in using this, um, items one, two, and three uh, are the most important uh, and always consistently of value as you evaluate the reliability index of the system. Uh, next slide, please. So the last output is a, a data sheet. Uh, <clears throat> this is an important sheet because it contains the list of, two, of the 2,000 cases simulated by the Monte Carlo uh, model. And each of the case that is listed here, uh, they are assigned a number, you call that seed number, to allow recovery of extraction of this case if you are interested in trying to do a detailed study of that case. So for instance, if you want to extract the case that exhibits the average uh, load loss out of the 2,000 iterations, then you can input the seed number on the graphic user interface and you can extract that case and see how uh, the model has rerouted the power uh, for the solution case. And also you can perform economic dispatch to see uh, the increase in overall cost because of the impact of the wildfire. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is my um, last slide. So uh, we've shown that the, uh, the probabilistic uh, threat model can have the following capabilities. First, it can assess the risk uh, in, in, of the wildfire threat in terms of megawatt loss or load loss from a variety of curves and, and tables, and you can compare the curves before the event and during the event. Also, you can compare the system performance uh, during uh, the event and also before uh, the event, uh, looking at the reliability insights that we have developed and also on the shape of the curves. And uh, you can extract the specific uh, solution case that you're interested in and uh, <clears throat> see what are the alternate routing paths that are possible if some of the lines are destroyed by the wildfire. And uh, also it has the ability to perform uh, redispatch the generators to examine the cost of uh, increase in production costs because of the wildfire. Uh, there are still uh, certain things that we are doing uh, on this project. <clears throat> we hope to finish this maybe three and five months. The first, the collection of the <clears throat> fire probability heat maps for more regions of interest. We are concentrating right now on California and Florida. And also um, the development of wildfire fragility curves for uh, electric assets. So this one also requires a lot of effort uh, to have fragility curves for every type of electric assets. And lastly, we explore the use of high-speed computers to speed up the uh, computations as we look into uh, broader uh, areas of interest in finer geographic um, resolutions. So right now for we tried a 64 bus IEEE system. Uh, it takes us a few minutes to do that, but when we apply this to a big system with about 20,000 uh, bosses, for instance, we're looking at an hour to two hours of computations uh, using the PC uh, desktop that we have. So uh, that's the reason for item number three. 
So um, these are all the presentations, uh, items that I have today. And thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I would be ready to ask, uh, ask some of your questions if you have some. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edgar. We're going to hold our questions till the end, um, but please do continue to put them into the chat and we will uh, keep track of those. Now we're going to turn it over to Feng Shu, also of Argonne, to talk about wildfire risk modeling and operations, planning for wildfire risk management. Feng. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Feng Shu from Argonne. And <clears throat> And first, thanks uh, DOE for organizing this uh, uh, seminar series. And uh, so today I have a two presentation back to back. Uh, the first one is about uh, uh, wildfire uh, risk modeling. And the second one is uh, <clears throat> how we can uh, incorporate this uh, understanding about the wildfire risk into operation and planning. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, work in the uh, mitigation part, uh, but uh, there are much fewer work in the risk modeling part. So I think I will uh, spend more time uh, on this part. I uh, hope everyone is fine with that. All right, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so what, what do we what do we mean by uh, risk modeling? <clears throat> so first, we want to understand uh, the contributing factors to the wildfire and their importance, can we prioritize them, right? That's the first step. And then we can uh, see that uh, whether we can uh, predict, whether we can forecast, so that uh, you know we can better uh, prepare. Um, so um, the uh, capability here are you know, a set of uh, statistical methods, uh, stochastic uh, progress uh, process models, and uh, machine learning. And the stochastic process is uh, <clears throat> to model the random events uh, on a time series. So it's a little bit different from the statistical model. Um, so our potential user uh, include the uh, utilities that uh, does not have a dedicated uh, analytical tools for the wildfire, and uh, and also uh, we uh, we know that uh, you know utilities have a lot of business to do. Maybe uh, sometimes they don't have the luxury time to look at uh, you know more advanced uh, you know or. Uh, the newly developed method to look at the wildfire. So we hope uh, we can provide some uh, useful thing here. Um, and also, if you're a policymaker or your developers, maybe you want to uh, take a look at, at uh, you know the fire risk in your area. Um, so in the previous presentation, I already introduced uh, uh, our data warehouse and the visualization platform. And, uh, and so. Um, this two presentation is going to uh, explore those data and see what we can uh, do to better understand the risk. All right. All right. So this is the um, the common sense um, about the uh, uh, contributing factor uh, to the wildfire. It includes the weather, uh, like wind speed, gust, temperature, humidity, and also about uh, few. Uh, like a vegetation type, you know, those kind of things. And third one is the uh, uh, power grid uh, operating condition. And, uh, and so that's uh, our in, uh, input data. So the output data are um, the fire incident report. And, uh, and so we're going to look at uh, uh, this input output data and trying to see if we can discover uh, the relationship between them. All right. So. And I just want to uh, briefly mention this, the fire danger indices. Um, <clears throat> this is not uh, commonly mentioned, uh, you know, uh, in literature. So uh, this essentially uh, is to uh, uh, lump the uh, weather information we just mentioned, and also the uh, fuel information or the environment information, and use some formula to uh, generate just a single number to indicate uh, the fire potentials. So this is normally used for uh, natural occurred wildfire, but uh, you know it could be very useful uh, to study the fire uh, caused by uh, power delivery. All right, so we have a KBDI, a PI, you know, a number of things. Uh, all right, so methodology, I will just uh, uh, talk through this. The data set, <clears throat> um, as I mentioned uh, in the first presentation, we have uh, uh, the incidents reports reported by the utilities, and we also have uh, the weather information, you know, the 
uh, fire potential index calculated uh, and also um, <coughs> the uh, many other uh, type of data. So uh, if you're interested, please uh, check out our pre previous presentation. All right, so that's our uh, input and output data. Uh, so first I'm going to talk about this uh, uh, statistical method and uh, um, it's a really uh, uh, quite standard. Um, I won't spend too much time on this. And just let you know that uh, you can perform a number of analysis uh, to figure out something. For example, in this uh, slides, we can see that uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, variables are statistically significant. For example, the fire potential index, and also there are another index called large fire potential probability, and also vegetation, right? Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to skip through this uh, to this uh, interesting model here. So, okay. All right. Um, okay, so let me. Okay, so. Fang, what, Fang, which slide would you like me to be on? Uh, actually, I'm clicking. Thank you. Uh, so, this is spatial temporal point per size modeling. So we are seeing this page, right? Actually, I have control, so you just need to let oh. me know if you're ready for me to switch. I think we're I think we're all caught up now. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Good. We're good. Uh, okay. So I'm not talking about the details here. Uh, leave that to later. Uh, so essentially, uh, let's look at this. Uh, um, what the model does. So this is the input data uh, from 2014, 19. Uh, that's a, a instance report, and also we. Um, uh, Get the data uh, environmental and the, the weather uh, data uh, for uh, from that period, and then we uh, have a spatial and temporal model to uh, train. So uh, the final result uh, is shown here. This is the uh, uh, the prediction of the weather. Uh, sorry, the uh, wildfire uh, in one location, and uh, the black dots are you know the uh, our model saying hey, there's no uh, fire, and the red dot are uh, the model saying that there are fire. Okay, so you can see that uh, this uh, we have uh, we can you know draw some curve here, and this uh, blue dots are actual fire incidents. So the fire actually occurred. So through this, uh, uh, you, if you compare this uh, blue dots with our curve, you can see that uh, you know it, it's uh, the the result does make sense, right? Um, but I just want to say that uh, you know the uh, Predicting results is only as good as the quality of your data, right? And unfortunately, um, there are not many like high quality data. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I won't go into details, but if you think you have very uh, good uh, data, um, please reach out to us. Uh, we can look at the data together with you. Uh, all right, so next page, please. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, altitude uh, prediction. So why the altitude is here? Uh, because uh, you know, in last year you see like the uh, uh, power safety uh, uh, shut off uh, program caused a significant disruption to the uh, <clears throat> to the life uh, in in California uh, last year, and uh, also we talked uh, to a uh, water utility um, on the west coast, and they were kind of frustrated and confused by the interruptions. Uh, and because you know they need to refresh their water tank, uh, you know, at a certain frequency to keep the water quality, or store the water for fire fighting, right? Um, but uh, you know, with this unpredicted, uh, you know, um, power shut off uh, operations, you know, they kind of like, uh, you know, been uh, disrupted. Um, so that's why you know we care about uh, the outage. But uh, we haven't the, done the uh, altitude forecasting for uh, wildfire yet, um, but here I'm going to show you um, the result we got for power outage uh, uh, prediction uh, for other weather hazards. Uh, for example, hurricane, snow storm, you know, uh, those kind of things. And the data we use is uh, what we connected uh, 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 you know, uh, from the public available website, uh, you know, uh, utility allows their outage numbers, right? And we collect that. Uh, we have uh, collected data uh, on the uh, east uh, coast of several states. And next page, please. So let me just give a little bit of motivation. <clears throat> so uh, 
if we plot the RT number in this chart, let's uh, uh, look uh, carefully here. The right curve, sorry, the right uh, arrow, it's a 3D accumulated wind. So notice that this is accumulated wind because we believe that uh, the weather force will accumulate and continuously impact the uh, power grid. So that's accumulated. And here, this blue uh, arrow, this dimension is the, uh, 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 the locations. So we rank the locations uh, with the, uh, uh, according to their OG numbers, right? And uh, now we look at this uh, uh, projection to this uh, plane, this uh, blue curve, look at this blue curve. So this blue curve shows you that, uh, you know, uh, when the accumulated wind force increase to a certain point, you see a sudden jump of the outages, right? And then it reached to the, you know, maximal and there, right? Uh, now, if you compare this one, Georgia, the right top uh, to the bottom one, and you can see that uh, it looks like the Georgia can withstand more wind force than the other two regions, right? because the jump is a much later stage, right? So, and if you look at the, the other projection on the green plane, this green curve here, right? And you will see that uh, although Georgia, they seem to be more resilient to the wind, but uh, once it collapsed, a lot of these uh, uh, locations in Georgia will have a very high uh, altitude ratio. So this uh, vertical axis are the altitude ratio between zero and one. But instead, if you look at the uh, North Carolina and the South Carolina, even it had the uh, earlier jump, there are very few uh, locations that had the large altitude ratio. So you can see that uh, you know the resilience uh, uh, of the power grid can be looked at from a different dimensions. So that's kind of our uh, you know motivation. So how we are going to model this? Uh, next page, please. So here we use the spatial temporal model. And uh, uh, as we said, um, the impact uh, from the weather is accumulated uh, through the time, right? Um, but also the uh, uh, impact also can come from the neighbor, uh, neighboring region because of the uh, topology of the electric connections, right? Uh, maybe the uh, propagation of the fault, right? So it might come from neighbor. So eventually your um, impact coming from two parts. So the first part is the, the direct cumulative weather impact. Uh, look at the function at the bottom. And the second term is the indirect impact from neighboring outage. And remember that, uh, you know, you have like a 50 to uh, several hundreds of uh, uh, weather variables. So which one you choose, right? So that's a very important. So here we use the deep neural network, uh, mu, to uh, let the neural network to, you know, uh, train and uh, put the weight on each of these uh, variables. Okay, next page. All right, let's look at the results. So first, let's look at the prediction. So we uh, uh, performed the prediction uh, on the three uh, uh, states, Georgia, North Carolina, and uh, Massachusetts, and uh, for a different time. So you can see that uh, this, uh, uh, dotted lines are actual uh, outages. The uh, uh, solid green lines uh, are the uh, predictions. So you can see that uh, our prediction is pretty good, right? Uh, maybe there's a little bit uh, off, but uh, you know we, it 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 is not that much, right? If you look at the the, uh, it's very consistent. So one thing I need to mention that this is the uh, in sample estimation. Uh, which does not mean that uh, you know uh, it will be very good uh, for the out of sample uh, performance, but uh, usually they are you know uh, very consistent, and at least this uh, uh, result says that you know our um, model can explain the data very well. Okay, so very good uh, prediction result. All right, that's next page, please. Okay. So remember that uh, we uh, modeled the uh, interaction or impact from the neighboring units, right? Neighboring locations. Uh, now, if we pull out these uh, parameters and uh, uh, plot on the graph, you will see that uh, 
so this uh, red arc means that uh, if location A uh, has outage, um, the location B uh, will most likely have a log uh, uh, outage. So this is the uh, you know the influence is in a statistic sense, right? It might be because uh, they are electrically connected, or it might be because the uh, fault propagated from location A to location B. But we don't know that. Um, but at least from the statistical point, we observe this. So, and if you plot this uh, uh, impact uh, on this uh, uh, graph, and you would see that uh, in each region there are some hubs, right? Uh, it looks like uh, these hubs are impacting. And the outage is on the neighboring uh, place. Okay, so uh, next, please. Next, please, please. All right. So next one, I want to show that uh, how this is uh, uh, related to the power system resilience, right? <clears throat> okay. So if you go to any resilience seminar, uh, I guarantee you will see this uh, graph uh, on the top right. So this is the graph used to illustrate. Uh, um, the uh, uh, definition of resilience. Uh, there are several stages. At the beginning, you have a little bit of degradation of the service, but at a certain point, the degradation uh, uh, accelerated and it get very bad and then to the bottom, and then your restoration start picking up, right? And then your service is restored. So this is the, so, um, <laughs> almost all the literature, you know, only talk about the definition in the conceptual way. Uh, to our best knowledge, we haven't seen any uh, work that can uh, quantify the resilience. Okay, uh, so the major reason is that uh, most of this work uh, trying to build uh, uh, a physical model um, bottom up, and uh, <clears throat> that is, uh, of course, can give you many benefits to understanding the mechanism, uh, understanding the uh, uh, technical tools. However, it loses the big picture, right? Uh, for example, you know. <clears throat> um, I don't know the pole will fall. I don't know the substation will be flooded. Uh, you know, that's not in my power flow model, not in my dispatch model, right? So, so there are so many things, you know, this physical model cannot capture. So what are, you can do is that, uh, you know, just room out at the system level and let the data speak for itself, all right? Okay, so if you look at the charts below, um, this is the, I took one of the um, prediction results in the previous page and flip up. So this up down image. And you can see that uh, uh, in this uh, chart, uh, I can tell you, if you give me your weather forecasting, uh, I can tell you when your uh, system are going to see a severe degradation of service and how much deeper that can go and when it can be uh, restored. And how long it lasts, how many uh, outages you, you 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 lost during the whole survey. So this is totally a quantitative uh, model here, and uh, you know this uh, this is the first time that uh, you know we can uh, quantitatively uh, characterize the system resilience, and we can also predict right. So yeah, this is a very uh, beautiful result. Um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So next page, please. All right, so what we have been doing is just a prediction, right? We predict uh, given uh, weather variables and we uh, predict. Um, but we can also tweak the parameters in the model and see how the prediction change. And uh, the tweaking might have some uh, suggestion, you know, in the real world. For example, uh, if I'm going to strengthen the link or if I'm going to reduce the impact from location A to location B, uh, that might means that uh, you know I'm putting the transmission line under uh, ground, or I'm uh, replacing the pole, right? So that in that way you can uh, reduce the influence from point A to point B, right? Um, you know, <clears throat> all the tweaking have might have some uh, indication in the real world, so we can actually do the tweaking and see how the altitude change, and uh, that might give us some uh, suggestion about uh, how we should improve the grid resilience. Uh, for example, in the first uh, uh, three uh, pictures, uh, we're kind of like uh, reduce the impact uh, among the locations. And you can see that uh, uh, the rightmost picture for North, Car North Carolina and South Carolina, uh, 
when you reduce um, the impact, you will see that uh, the outage decreases very quickly. However, it will peter out. The, the, the benefit will diminish, right? Uh, but uh, in Massachusetts, you would see that, uh, you know, the effort can go a long way. And uh, yeah, uh, if you are uh, restricted by your budget, um, you know, you might have uh, several options, but which options are going to give you uh, more reductions, right? Uh, of course, you can, um, you know, look at your topology, you know, run some uh, dynamic simulation and, uh, you know, uh, change parameters, you know, put several more transmission line there, and then you can do all the kind of analysis, right? Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, when the weather hits you, uh, it has a, a lot of more that not captured in the analysis, right? So uh, we believe that uh, if you look at uh, from a data, from endpoint data uh, perspective, that might give you uh, some insight. Uh, so right now we are trying to figure out, uh, you know, uh, how the model uh, corresponds to your real system. And we're trying to make sense out of it. For example, if we adjust this parameter, what that means uh, to a real system and why this pattern makes sense from the you know topology you know uh, sense. So we we are we are uh, trying very hard to uh, figure this out. So if you think uh, you know you, you have expertise or you know you 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 have real data or you know you think you could help us to understand better this phenomenon, understand the model, uh, please please reach out to us. Yeah, we really need your help. Uh, all right. So next page. Okay, so this uh, uh, work is, uh, you know, uh, it's part of the Argon work uh, coordinated by our great program uh, lead, uh, Mark Pagey, uh, Mark Pagey, and we have a lot of guys from Energy System, and uh, we also have brilliant uh, prof uh, professors and uh, students from Nigeria Tech working on this. Uh, all right, so next page. Okay. And most of the work are supported by the Argon LDRD uh, funding, and also the advanced uh, grid modeling program under the uh, OE. Uh, so, and also we uh, have a regular meeting with the South Southern California Edison, and their you know advice uh, consulting is really uh, valuable. Uh, we thank them all. All right, uh, I think this is the end of the first presentation. Uh, uh, how much time do I have for the second one? We are running a little long, so if you could speed this one up, maybe in about do it in about five minutes. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, next page. Uh, next page. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So uh, I will talk about the uh, some of our work in the three perspectives: the operation stage, the planning stage, and the disaster response stage. So I just want to emphasize that uh, you know uh, uh, we have a lot of work in this area that can be used uh, to uh, mitigate the welfare risk, and uh, you know many other national labs also have the work. So uh, this is only like a sample of the you know uh, things we can do to help industry. Um, all right. So next page. So the first one is uh, you know we talk about the public safety power shutoff program. It caused a lot of. Uh, uh, outages, right? So, can we do it uh, in a uh, more optimal way? Um, so, uh, here we develop a, a model to optimally uh, uh, dispatch the shutoff program. So, uh, you have to, uh, you can uh, decide which line to because you have a lot of options to uh, uh, de-energize your facility, right? Um, but uh, which of the combination uh, give you less uh, outage, but uh, uh, also mitigate uh, your uh, fire risk, right? So we have this uh, model here, take the input of the wire fire risk associated with each transmission line. So currently we're using KBDI, but uh, of course you can use other fire potential index uh, as a risk. Uh, also uh, the output uh, you know, are you know, set of lines uh, to be de-energized uh, to reduce the probability of uh, causing a fire, right? And also minimize the load shedding. Uh, one thing uh, special about that is, uh, you know, uh, if you do the switching, you probably create an island uh, that uh, without any power support, right? So here we have uh, anti-islanding uh, mechanism to prevent that happen. 
And also uh, we enforce n minus one security. So even after you do the switch, after the switch, your grid is also n minus one secure. All right, and next page, please. And the other thing you can do that is to reduce the demand, right? So the less demand, the less power flow on the line, you know, you have my more margins to, you know, to redispatch, right? So here we have uh, 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 done some work uh, at the uh, actual facility at uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and some near uh, by farms. So basically we have a, a, a scheme that can um, uh, optimally dispatch and uh, coordinate uh, the different energy resource like the air conditioner and the, the uh, energy storage uh, fans and other things so that uh, the total demand will be shipped, will be uh, lowered um, without much uh, uh, inconvenience uh, to the data operations. All right, so next, please. And now the coming to the design uh, stage. So uh, <clears throat> in normally, you know, when you uh, do the uh, expansion, you consider the future load, right? The growth uh, of your load and uh, many other things. But now you also need to consider the potential uh, fire risk. So you want to kind of like, uh, you know, uh, don't, uh, if you have options, you don't want to across the area that uh, uh, may uh, likely to be a hot zone in the future, right? So here we consider this, uh, uh, you know, these are scenarios, and we propose a, a two-stage uh, stochastic optimization model to choose, uh, uh, you know, which line you should put underground. Uh, and also, uh, we also consider in the future you are operating in the power shutoff program, uh, so that your total um, interruption from the PSPS will be minimized. And uh, <clears throat> of course, you know, this is the uh, study. Uh, on the magical uh, power grids on uh, a uh, hypothetical scenario. But, uh, you know, if you, um, you know, uh, would like to, how this can benefit your uh, grids, you know, we can uh, look uh, together with you. All right, next one. And also, uh, we have seen that uh, the PG&E and uh, Southern California Edison on the West Coast, they start using um, back grids to uh, mitigate the RTG uh consequence right so uh, if i have to perform uh, power shut off uh, then uh how can how can i support the community right so now they are going to develop the uh, uh micro grids to uh, mitigate the ultimate uh, consequence uh, next one please so in argon we have a lot of work in this uh, uh network of the mac grids so uh, uh the picture above shows that uh, you know in the campus of uh, uh Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, we have a, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, renewable energy, like a wind turbine. We also have energy storage. And, uh, you know, they have the independent uh, energy resource. So uh, at a time of emergency, actually, we can disconnect the uh, IIT campus from the grid, and they can support by themselves. And then you can uh, uh, organize by several individual, uh, um, you know, uh, piece of uh, uh, grid, and they support. Uh, they are self-sufficient, uh, right? And what's more is that uh, you know, uh, in the next stage, uh, we uh, experimented with this uh, in, in this uh, Brown, uh, Brownsville um, IIT micro grid cluster, which uh, you know we connect uh, uh, the IIT campus uh, micro grid with uh, uh, another micro grid, uh, so that uh, you know they can support themselves. Uh, next page, please. And, and 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 if you want to have a more uh, flexibility, you know, the boundary of your grids could be changed, right? So we have a, a bunch of, uh, you know, research on this uh, to, uh, you know, uh, help to optimize the, the boundary uh, uh, dynamically so that uh, your uh, total uh, load loss is minimized and that your uh, utilization of your energy storage or your renewable generation is uh, maximized. All right, so next page, please. And this one is about uh, the uh, 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 disaster response, right? So uh, suppose uh, you have a very large distribution grid and uh, then you are uh, threatened by, uh, for example, a hurricane or you're threatened by uh, wildfire. <clears throat> and uh, we have this uh, uh, project uh, uh, in which we use the uh, solar and the storage and the uh, you know mobile storage uh, to uh, help uh, support the uh, distributing grid 
Um, but also uh, we uh, can uh, co-optimize the crew dispatch uh, because uh, when you have damage in your system, uh, you will send your uh, crew repair truck to the location to do the you know, job. Um, but that decide that significantly impact uh, how soon you can recover, right? So we co-optimize the two activity, the one in the power grid, the other in the transport network, so that uh, you know they achieve the maximum speed for recover. And uh, you know this one could run like a very large system up to like a ten thousand uh, node system. Uh, okay, next please. All right, so uh, you know this is just the part of the work we have done. And in the next page, you can see that uh, you know uh, this work are uh, funded by uh, Argon LDRD, the Advanced Grid Modeling Program under OE, uh, Solar Energy Technology Office under EERE, and also RPIE and uh, the Grid Modernization Lab Consultium. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, you know uh, the work I uh, talk I want to talk today. Uh, if you do feel some of the part is uh, might be helpful to you, or you have some data uh, that you want to look uh, with us together, please feel free to reach out to me. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much. There's a lot to go through there. Um, now we want to invite Jim Kuiper to discuss Gator. So, uh, Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to start by uh, summarizing kind of this uh, characterizing this talk. OK, so uh, the difference uh, here is that uh, we're looking at results from climate models and uh, they they include data for the you know recent history on both observations and modeled results. And then there's projections for mid century and end of century estimates related to fire risk. So. This would be more along the lines of data that would help um, look at what may occur in the future based on climate modeling. Okay, next slide. Okay, so um, this tool is, it's a Python code um, and it, um, there are terabytes of results from these climate models um, and uh, the repository of data that's been distilled for this uh, work includes uh, the eight variables that are listed there. Um, and we have daily values spanning three 10 year periods. So there's historical period, mid century and end of century. And this has all been done for the majority of North America at a 12 kilometer resolution. Um, so there are many dimensions here that we're trying to distill down into some results and um, Beyond this talk um, and this slide, um, there are also multiple climate models in this repository um, that I'm not talking about today. So it's it's a very large data repository with many potential uses. Um, this is just one of them. Next slide. Uh, so we've already talked about this index a bit. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, it's it's a, an index for wildfire potential uh, it's based on daily maximum temperature, daily precipitation, and annual accumulated precipitation. So it's really a drought index, and it ranges from 0 to 800. Um, values over 600 are usually seen as extreme fire risk. And um, Fang mentioned some other wild, wildfire index indices. Um, those are, we'll be working on that in the future. Um, right now, we just have the KBDI. Next slide. Uh, so continuing on it, um, it's been computed for most of North America uh, for uh, historical observations, um, kind of to provide a validation data set and some baseline data. And then the climate model is run for the same time period so that you can look at any bias the model might have um, from what's been observed. And then they take uh, uh, potential future conditions related on projections about carbon dioxide and, and greenhouse emissions and, and those sorts of things and uh, examine how the model performs uh, with those assumptions injected. Um, this particular index um, performs best in regions that are less sensitive to wind effects and um, that have sufficient fuel to fuel the wildfire. So 
um, it doesn't capture every aspect of, of wildfire um, risk. And um, Ben mentioned uh, two other indices. Uh, there's a variety of them, and we'll be adding more as this uh, work goes forward. Uh, next slide. So at the at the right there is a shot of uh, results for the um, extent of the grid. Um, so the reddish band in Mexico there is is more of an edge effect. It's not uh, it's not quite right. It needs to be trimmed. But otherwise, um, the data are, are computed. And uh, what I'm showing there is um, some is a result that's been output by this code based on on running it and um, this is the 95th percentile KVDI for uh, 2002, uh, taken from the, mo the climate modeling results. 95th percentile would be that 95% of the days in that year were over that value that's shown. So obviously in the Southwest, you're seeing that 95% of the days are 751 to 800 in extreme fire risk and um, other regions of the country obviously have uh, lower risk. Um, so these uh, statistics I, I've recently computed, uh, the ones shown here, just looking at monthly and annual average KBDI, and then um, other 95th percentile. And what we can do with the climate model results is, is take the historical period, 95th percentile, and then look at what would change in the future. So this would be the number of days over the 95th percentile per year for those three or two future periods. Okay, next slide. So as another example, um, this is the 95th percentile KBDI, and I've superimposed uh, wildfire locations. So this is computed for um, year 2000, and um, you can see that in some cases the the wildfires correlate um, well with the uh, KDBDI high values and and some less so. But most notably at the, at the right there, this distinguishes this particular effort from some of the others presented, is that we're looking at these future periods. So uh, one thing to keep in mind is um, if something was already high risk in the baseline. Um, then you're looking, you know, in the future periods uh, of an increase. So a um, a low number there means that um, change, dramatic change, isn't expected. But on the whole, um, almost 100% of the country is expected to rise in this particular index, and some very significantly so. Uh, so that's one of the uses of this data set. Um, many other statistics can be uh, computed, um, and it's uh, the tool facilitates uh, those computations. Next slide. As another example, this is the the average monthly KBDI for 2004 at left, again with the the wildfire locations from that year superimposed. And then I just uh, sampled it. So those four areas marked on the map um, are shown in the graph at, uh, at right. So in blue, uh, Cerrito uh, fire in California from 2004, uh, one of the larger wildfires from that year. And you can see over the span of um, the decadal uh, computations, how that KDB I value widely varies um, over different months. So um, this is just showing um, both the magnitude and the variation of these statistics for these four particular regions. So obviously you can um, generate quite a bit of um, information from uh, looking deeper into these statistics and these um, characteristics, um, both for different regions and within the same region to see um, temporal patterns and projected future ones. All right, next slide. Um, so one of the ways, um, one of the outcomes of this is, um, and this is, is in progress, we'll be adding some sample results to the energy zones mapping tool. So this tool is a completely separate effort, but it is a publicly available web-based mapping tool. It has a large geospatial data library, about uh, 330 layers 
that are focused on energy infrastructure, energy resources, and other citing factors re relevant to energy analysis, and then some reference and background layers. Um, it provides suitability modeling and analysis for power generation and energy corridor paths. So as an example of wind turbine um, suitability model, you can take a variety of factors um, that, um, that factor into where a good place to site a wind turbine would be, and you can generate a national heat map and um, analyze that in this tool. So as we add this KBDI um, fire, wildfire risk, we can uh, start looking at potential impacts to infrastructure and um, even suitability for new infrastructure and, and take into account wildfire risk as a variable. And that can either be future risk or um, historical. All right, uh, next slide. And I'll just sum up um, my role in this. I'm a GIS um, an expert, and um, we have an entire climate and atmospheric modeling um, department here. So uh, the folks listed here are most of, most of them are PhD level scientists that um, have been doing a lot of climate modeling. And then the actual statistics were computed by a, um, an intern last summer. Um, so uh, DOE sponsors interns and um, Emily worked with the uh, climate uh, professionals and uh, they generated that. KDBI, KBDI addition to the repository that we're using here. Um, my main role has been um, coding things uh, like the tool and, um, and technical coordinator for the energy zones mapping tool. All right, um, that sums up my presentation. Thanks for your attention and um, I'll be ready to answer any questions at the end. Thank you so much, Jim, we appreciate that. Our last speaker from Argonne is Ian Hyde, and he's going to discuss the National Preparedness Analytics Center. Ian? All right, great. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Meredith, and to the entire DOE team. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Again, my name is Ian Hyde. I'm the Deputy Director of the National Preparedness Analytics Center. We are a part of the Decision and Infrastructure Sciences Division at Argonne National Laboratory. Um, I'll get into our specific capabilities in a moment, but just as a preface, uh, our team is, uh, we are in an interdisciplinary center, which will be reflected in some of the tools and resources that I share today. So while some of what I share is not explicitly directed at wildfire, it can be applied in multiple hazard contexts and in multiple disciplines as well. Um, next slide, please. So to tell you a little bit about what we do uh, as a preface to the tools and resources that I highlight, um, our capabilities fall into decision science, modeling and simulation. Um, a lot of our work is done uh, through geospatial analysis and data visualization um, with a focus on uh, all hazards and all phases of the emergency management cycle. So anything from resilience to preparedness, hazard mitigation, response and recovery. Um, a lot of that ties back to social and behavioral systems as well as infrastructure sciences. Um, so anything from thinking about vulnerable populations and people to infrastructure protection. Um, and as you can see, our people are also a, a broad range of disciplines, uh, which is what we bring to each of the projects that we do. Uh, so next slide, please. So I'm going to start by highlighting a couple of current analytical tools and resources that we have publicly available that can be used at all levels of government, uh, federal, state, local, um, and then talk a little bit about what's in the pipeline, where we're going with our research as well. Um, and we're always glad to hear feedback on what is most useful for those end users out in the field, given that our work is very much meant to be applied. Uh, so next slide, please. The first tool I'd like to highlight is the resilience analysis and planning tool. This is something that our team has developed uh, in partnership with the federal emergency management agency. Uh, the resilience analysis and planning tool is available on the FEMA website at www.fema.gov forward slash wrapped. Um, I will mention that there are a number of YouTube tutorial videos that are available on the landing page there, as well as the underlying research that led to the development of this tool. Next slide, please. So 
As I mentioned, uh, RAPT is a free and publicly available GIS tool. Uh, you can use uh, the story map and web map tool that's available on the FEMA website, as well as access the underlying data. What really sets RAPT apart is that it allows the combined analysis of population and community data from the US Census. Um, it also brings in a number of infrastructure data layers from High Field Open or the Homeland Infrastructure Foundational level data. Um, and it brings in hazard layers, including historic hazards, uh, risk data, and then some real time severe weather forecasts from the National Weather Service. Um, so bringing all of those together gives you a way to be able to look at uh, different hazards or different aspects of a community in different ways uh, to assess risk and plan for resilience. I will mention there are a number of data layers available both at the county and at the census tract level. So next slide, please. So this slide just highlights a few of the different types of risk data that are available in the RAPT tool. Um, in collaboration with the National Weather Service, for example, um, we have been able to implement a number of real-time weather watches and warnings that you can view within the tool uh, and overlay with a lot of the data sets that are in there. Uh, also, in collaboration with FEMA's Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration, uh, we've been able to include the estimated annualized frequency of risks for 14 or 15 different hazards, excuse me, uh, from the National Risk Index. Uh, we also have national flood hazard zones and historic data uh, for tornadoes and hurricane tracks. Um, and uh, you can see in there that wildfire is one of those hazards that we do have uh, the annualized frequency of risk for. Um, next slide, please. So just for a brief moment, I want to talk a bit about how you might be able to explore this tool in the context of wildfire. This is an example of uh, how you can combine the layers that I've referenced and use some of the analysis tools that are embedded in wrapped. Um, so, for example, I mentioned the national risk index. It can show you that annualized frequency of wildfires in a particular county. Um, and from there, uh, the incident analysis tool can allow a user to actually draw a polygon around the threatened area and see some of the infrastructure of interest in and outside of the threatened area. So, for example, on the screen right now, uh, you're seeing hospitals that may be in the area, but you could also look at things like nursing homes, schools, or other infrastructure that is included within RAPT. Um, you can also click on the population layers, such as individuals with a disability, uh, population over 65, um, or importantly, in an evacuation context, the percent of the population without access to a vehicle. Um, so you can use that incident analysis tool again to draw the polygon around the area at risk and identify the vulnerable infrastructure and populations in a community of interest. Again, this can be done during an incident, but it is also also useful for pre event planning, whether for hazard mitigation projects um, or for developing various different plans. Uh, so next slide, please. So another thing I wanted to briefly talk about um, is some of the work that we've been doing around COVID-19. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge upfront that it may not seem uh, like uh, pandemic related work could help in a wildfire context. Uh, but one of the things about COVID-19 is that it has occurred alongside multiple different disasters. Um, and some of the impact assessment work that we've been doing has been able to apply in a wildfire and in a hurricane context. Uh, so to tell you a little bit more about what we've been doing, we've been providing data analytic support to 20 plus federal agencies involved in COVID-19 recovery efforts. And a key objective has really been to collect and analyze different data that gives us a near real time sense of the socioeconomic impacts. So things like impacts on households, on jobs, on state and local government revenue, um, some of those secondary and tertiary things that we're seeing from the pandemic aside from the public health impacts. Um, those uh, analyses can provide insight into communities impacted by other types of disasters. So, for example, with the Western wildfires that we saw uh, in 2020, we were able to use some of our products to assess some of the economic and financial impacts along with housing impacts uh, in those communities when you overlay COVID and the wildfire disaster. Um, I am pleased to say that in 2021, a big focus of this effort is going to be providing analytic resources to state, local, tribal, and territorial jurisdictions, and I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, the maps you see on the screen are just an example of our measures of county economic impact, which is looking at the change in gross domestic product uh, since the onset of the pandemic. Um, those results are available on a monthly basis, so you can see 
Uh, the darker colors in October show slightly more severe economic impacts than we're seeing in January of 2021. Next slide, please. So on May 10th, uh, pleased to say that we will be releasing a number of the analytic products that we've developed through this mission assignment. Again, this was very federally focused uh, in 2020, and now we're trying to open those up to support state, local, tribal, and territorial decision-making into 2021. Um, so you can see the forthcoming uh, products on the screen. Those include the County Economic Impact Index that I just mentioned. That's measuring that estimated monthly change in county gross domestic products since the onset of COVID-19. That's updated on a monthly basis. Uh, we also have the indices to measure impacts on state government revenue and local government revenue. Uh, important if you're thinking about uh, anything from the ability to, to pay for non-federal match to thinking about budgetary impacts for operations and even planning in out years for things like wildfire mitigation. We also have a housing stability index that's been measuring the number of households that are more at risk of eviction and foreclosure. Again, if you overlay another disaster uh, like a wildfire on top of the pandemic, you're gonna see some cascading or additional impacts and this helped provide insight into those conditions on the ground. Um, and then another access that our uh, index that we've developed to help in long-term recovery planning is our internet access index, which measures household access to high-speed internet based on the availability of broadband um, and household subscription rates, something that can be useful for anything from uh, telehealth and distance learning on through to engaging communities uh, with emergency management programs, uh, vacuums and otherwise. Uh, next slide, please. So just very briefly, I'm gonna to touch on two of our ongoing research and development activities and next slide again. So first, we are working with uh, DOE's Infrastructure Security and uh, Energy Restoration Division on an energy subsector risk characterization. Um, through this, we are estimating the exceedance probability of electric outages of certain magnitude uh, disasters caused by wildfires, hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, ice storms, and severe thunderstorms. With this, we're going to be using historical data and supplemented from some of our advanced climate models uh, that you've already heard about from my colleagues today. Um, we're also looking at overlaying uh, the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 scenarios on top of this to take climate change into consideration. Um, our hazard scenarios will then be run through our EPFAST and EGRIP electric subsystem models to assess impacts to the electric system. Um, and this will result in reports uh, of estimates for demand loss, uh, unserved energy, customers affected, equipment damage, and restoration time. Um, this is an ongoing project where we expect to have more results in the fall um, and look forward to being able to share more in the future. And finally, one last slide. So I want to talk just briefly about our rapid assessment of impacts and needs model. This is a project we've just gotten underway, but uh, as somebody who's worked in disaster recovery for more than the past decade, one of the things that we have seen on the ground is that there can be a gap in our understanding of true disaster impacts uh, all the way up to six months or a year after a disaster. And you're trying to think about what do your recovery and reinvestment priorities look like uh, to try to restore your communities. Um, so the, the theory behind the case of this tool is that we're gonna provide rapid, high confidence, quantitative uh, assessments of impacts to disasters, to infrastructure, housing and the economy. Ultimately, our goal is to get very place specific. So at the sub county level, so we can identify priority areas of interest and characterize those impacts. Um, we will be using some of the event generation characteristics methodology for the previous project I just mentioned, um, starting with hurricanes. So thinking about trajectory, intensity and duration, uh, overlaying those event characteristics with existing infrastructure and population data to then develop estimates of impact. Um, in phase two in 2022, we're really planning to get to multiple hazards, uh, wildfire among those, uh, to also incorporate high resolution climate change data to really get to uh, very specific estimates of impact to different types of infrastructure, to units of housing and to economy, the economy, including jobs, GDP, and otherwise. So uh, something to stay tuned uh, with. We're very excited to get going with this and we'll look forward to sharing this in the future. Um, and so with that, I will turn it back over and be ready for questions at the end. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ian. Uh, now we want to introduce our first speaker from Sandia National Laboratories, Russell Gale, who's going to be talking about Summit. Russell. 
Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Hope everyone's having enjoying the presentation I've been so far. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a tool that we've been working on, or a toolkit called Summit. So Summit is short, uh, as you can see there, for the Standard Unified Mapping, Modeling, and Integration Toolkit. Um, next slide, please. So for just a little bit of history about the kind of where Summit came from. So Summit originally was um, was used to identify, or was rather used to uh, address gaps in the and the workflow for um, modeling and modeling and simulation platforms. And so, uh, in general, our goal is to be able to efficiently produce data from multiple scenarios, to be able to um, archive, share, reuse, not just the data, but also the models themselves, and then be able to allow those, that data to be used for future planning, comparison, uh, response, or response operations. Uh, next slide, please. So kind of this, uh, this image shows a general idea of kind of how we found, where Summit fits in the, um, in the spectrum. So across the various different uh, interest par interested parties, they have a number of different applications from risk analysis to the hurricane program or some fires. Uh, we also have a set of modeling simulation and data assets. So that could be your threat model, your hazard model, as well as some downstream impact modeling or uh, response modeling. Uh, and Summit really aims to fit right in between all of those. So Summit is, is a, a, one way to think about it, is a tool that allows you to generalize um, all these different types of modeling and sim modeling simulation and data assets uh, into, and to be able to put them into kind of a single application. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in this slide summarizes kind of the different ways in which we have, uh, we've been using Summit. Uh, so kind of on the top workflow, it's, uh, it advertises Summit for uh, planning purposes. Uh, so kind of initially you take in a set, a, a single scenario. And so in this case, I, when I say a scenario, it's uh, you define some sort of hazard and then uh, you give it that for that hazard, you have some amount of, of impact. Uh, we can take that, take that scenario, um, put it into kind of a batch, batch of the batch can be either a Monte Carlo or other type of simulation, uh, we take that library, do an analysis on that library to be able to help determine uh, various things such as clearance times or the need evacuations and whatnot and that, those types of things. Uh, we also have the ability in Summit to ingest live data. So that includes hazard data, weather, traffic. Uh, and then from that, we can also output data and visualization and, uh, and uncertainties for uh, response operations as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the process in Summit, Summit in itself is two different applications. There is a Summit server and a Summit um, uh, a Summit user, uh, the, the Summit user part of it. And so in the, and there's the first stage of that is, you, is a discovery phase. And so in discovery phase, we have uh, a list or a way for you to query and find a list of all the different types of modeling data and simulation assets. We also have a way for you to discover different types of scenarios that have already been run. So uh, for the, in this kind of context of this series, uh, you can go and look and see if there are scenarios available uh, or templates, what we call them, templates available to run a wildfire scenario. Uh, then you can configure them in, in the configuration phase. We, so for the, each template, we define um, different types of what we call slots and each slot can accept a model uh, and so and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in, in upcoming slides. Once you've uh, configured your scenario template, you then have the ability to execute that template. And again, you can execute either a single run of that template or you can put it into, or you can parameterize your inputs um, and then do a, a, batch, a batch analysis of that. And then finally, you can take the outputs of that uh, both from a, for a single run or for the set of runs uh, and you can analyze that data as well. So that's kind of what Summit is um, at, on a high level. If you go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to, uh, before I kind of get into the in-depth of how we, how Summit has been applied for wildfire, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how Summit has already been used. So one of the, um, one of the better engagements we had back in 2016 was actually with the California Exercise and Simulation Center. Uh, we delivered a, not just Summit, but also some Summit, well, we, some su Summit templates. Uh, as part of their Decisions Matter exercise series. And so we worked with the um, 
We worked with the Sacramento Metro Fire uh, and the Cal Fire Program, and the, or rather the Shish Gap Program, the State Homeland Security Grant Program, to develop these templates. Uh, and it worked, we developed a strong package that we were able to deploy to them. Um, next slide, please. And so I just wanted to, this kind of shows a little bit more in depth of how Summit works, especially particularly for the wildfire experience. Uh, and so this, the, the picture you see here is something that we call a scenario template. And this is actually one of the, the hardened template that we did deliver to as part of this um, state of California engagement. And so as, you, uh, as an input, you have um, your hazard model. In this case, it's, it's a wildfire. We have some downstream impact models. Uh, in this case, this is uh, population, infrastructure, economy. And then we have some of these planning and response models. And in this case, we have uh, evacuation. And so they, these arrows represent the different types of data you can put into each of these different um, slots. Uh, the data errors going out to represent the work, the data flow. So how um, the data flow out. So how the data is coming out of each of these each of these slots and into the next model. And then the finally, all the arrows that are pointing from slots going outward. Those are the, those represent kind of the output data for the um, for your scenario run. And so the the nice thing about Summit is that once you have defined a uh, your rather than defining rather than tailoring your application to the specific model, um, Summit will aid you in the process of connecting any of these of any type of model that you can fit into any of these slots. So instead of using um, the wildfire model for your for the ha the instead of using uh, one uh, different one particular wildfire model, you could uh, use different ones, or you could input different population models or different economy models. Uh, and so Summit makes that process of managing all these different types of models and the data input and or data to and from these models. Uh, it makes it very it makes it much more streamlined. Uh, next next slide, please. So finally, as, as kind of I mentioned, uh, we have the once you have selected your scenario template, you have the ability to select uh, for in particular which model you want to put in there. And so in cut and this this uh, picture is highlighting. The, or is showing that you can just uh, select different models. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then we have, uh, so we have all the user interface tools for you to be able to tailor those. And so in this case, we can kind of see the, um, so for the, in, in this particular example, we use the Farsight, or it shows using the Farsight um, wildfire model. And so it has its own set of inputs. And this is kind of how the, the interface to those set of inputs. Uh, and so that would be a uh, different factors such as temperature, humidity, precipitation, the weather conditions, as well as the ignition point, so where the wildfire started. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, we have for each, so then for each of the different models under there, you can select different things. And so uh, one of the kind of as mentioned in other, in other uh, presentations as well, uh, infrastructure is one of the most interesting topics. And so we can you can select to include which particular types or all types of infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, once you're able to run the scenario, you're able to view the results. And so uh, we have a simple GIS display or a GIS ready display that can take in a lot of the different types of results for the GIS results and then overlay them onto a map. So in this case, we see um, the result of a wildfire. And so if, uh, there's a time slider you can Click and see how it grows based on the on the model that was being run. In the case of the far site model, uh, you can kind of see the uh, on the right side. You can kind of see um, a color magnitude, so the it's kind of a notional scale, and it shows if it's the I believe it's a, a white hot type model. So if you have um, the white, the whiter the cell, the larger or more intensive the wildfire was based on its perimeter. And then uh, and if you go to the next slide, please. And then finally, you can we have the ability to toggle on and off the different infrastructure layers. And so you can see if any of those wildfire perimeters um, overlaid or sorry intersected any of the any of the interest, interest any of the infrastructures of interest, uh, you're able to see that and visualize it on the map as well. And so not shown here is also we also can do things such as evacuation. So if you pick a um, evacuation zone, you can see the population within that zone and the different ways in which a the population may evacuate as well. 
Um, next slide, please. I believe that covers, I kind of went through it a little quickly, but uh, if you have any questions, so that kind of covers the generally, general, in general, what is summit and how it has been applied for um, wildfire situations, wildfire modeling and simulation. Thank you so much, Russell. We really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, next, we have Leo Bynum of Sandia, who's going to demonstrate the fast map tool. Uh, Leo will be playing a couple of videos during his presentation. So for those of you who are dialed in on your phone rather than through the computer app, you will not be able to hear the audio of the videos, but when we post the recordings, you can go back and hear them then. So Leo, we are going to give you control of the presentation, or actually give you control so you can load your presentation and you oh, are, yeah. I have control. Look at that. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, stand by one. As I talk to myself here. Uh, and. Are we being shared? There's not enough memory in the system resources to start PowerPoint. I'm not sure what's up with that. All right. Well, if you would like us to drive the slides. Yeah, maybe you could videos. drive. Okay, we'll sure. do that. Yeah, that's that sounds better. Then uh, then I don't have to think. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll wait till you get the first one up and we will go from there. So we were looking for the PowerPoint uh, rather than the first video. Is that the right slide? That is not mine. Oh. Oh, okay. Let's see here. One second. Okay, we do not have them in here because they were coming from your desktop. Um, could you just? Hmm. I I think I uploaded them, but uh, here let's okay. not uh, let's not waste too much more time. Can I? Uh, uh, well, I'm not quite sure what to do oh. from here. I, okay. uh, we, uh, so hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I'm Leo Bynum, uh, Sandy National Labs. Uh, Russell, who was just on, is one of my work colleagues. And uh, I'm here to mostly talk about the uh, geospatial team that we have here at Sandia and the core capabilities and some frameworks that we have. So I'm going to show a couple of uh, applications that we've done in the past, but uh, you know, generally folks need, um, you know, everyone has their own um, uh, uh, unique needs. And so uh, often we are uh, developing custom capabilities, but again, we have a lot of uh, underlying frameworks that we can draw upon that are already built and uh, pulled together. So I wanted to show a couple of videos. The first one is an electric power interdependency uh, application that we've developed. Uh, and this is this is a low side notional one. We have some, um, uh, uh, so I, I'll, uh, I'll show that one. The, uh, the thing I want to note on this is, and uh, this would be by the way uh, uh, for the control center there, we're looking at the interdependency. Um, uh video if you can cue that up uh and the things to note are uh, uh the cascading impacts uh that um time dynamics are incorporated into this um, and also we don't just show the electric power outage uh, as it propagates but we actually go inside of certain facilities that are impacted and look at the uh, component dependencies inside of there and so that we think is kind of unique um, and so for this particular video, uh, we're doing it on some hypothetical oil wells uh, that uh, need electric power, but these oil wells could easily be a hospital or a cell phone tower, and we could look at uh, either generators or a battery life capacity. Anyway, give it a roll and, uh, and you'll uh, see what we're doing. Hi, my name is Leo Bynum from Sandia National Labs, and today I'd like to do a really quick demonstration of a prototype application that models infrastructure interdependency and cascading failures. In this particular data set, we have some fabricated uh, data of oil fields, 
and some hypothetical oil wells that are serviced by uh, power plants, power transmission lines, down to transformers, distribution lines, and then further we have a number of communication nodes and communication links that all connect to a central command point to uh, monitor all these wells. This web application we can pan and zoom and click on any of the assets and get information about them. Also we can click on a particular well and we can also get its status which is online on the grid and running. If we go over here to this single point of failure power line and we fail that power line we can go back over and look at the well status but we can also see the power failure cascading out of course this would happen almost instantaneously but it's uh, delayed to show the interdependency logic the well is now uh, off the grid and running on a generator and this generator is consuming fuel and over time it will in fact exhaust its fuel the generator will go offline as will the well we can go back over and repair this power line and again we can see the power cascade on back through the system and eventually turning on the grid and the well becomes operational but uh, the generator is still off and the fuel is exhausted. That's the demo. Thanks for watching. And uh, uh, so that's the first one, and we have uh, a second one. I don't know if this is coming out in full screen mode on my side. On my end, I'm only seeing kind of a smallish uh, um, uh, version of the video down to about uh, four inches square. But uh, the second one uh, is um, a tool that we uh, that we did in the past called uh, FastMap, and it uh, looks at infrastructure inf impacts for natural disasters. Uh, the one that we're going to be showing today is for an earthquake, but it could easily be a fire damage uh, or an evacuation zone. The important things to note on this one are the nationwide infrastructure. But uh, the other thing that we want to show here, which is not uh, particular to uh, infrastructure or really anything except uh, a broader geospatial capability that we've uh, actually got a patent on is um, this user data import. So we can quickly import user data. The user, not, not some admin, uh, can import the data, uh, arbitrarily symbolize it, um, push it out, broadcast it, uh, and then um, this capability is a little bit like Twitter, but instead of uh, with just 140 characters, you get a full map and not just a picture of a map, but a full dynamic interact interactive map that you can you use, markup, uh, and retweet. Uh, anyway, I think it'll mostly speak for itself, uh, so let's go ahead and roll that one. Hi, my name's Leo Bynum, and I'm at Sandia National Labs here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I'm here to demonstrate this tool called FastMap, which is an infrastructure browsing tool that we use here internally. But also I wanted to show, uh, incorporated in this tool, is this unique ability to go and share, publish, and collaborate, which I think has applications across the entire GIS domain. We've developed that here at Sandia Labs and have filed for patent on it. Let's take a look at the tool first and then we'll get into the publishing. First of all, uh, we have a moving map, of course. As a matter of fact, a number of base maps. Uh, we also can go and bring up a number of infrastructure sectors. And I'll show just a few very quickly and not to show them all. But for instance, here are all the airports and the air traffic control system nationwide in the transportation domain. We can look at rail. Here's all the uh, Amtrak stations, rail, uh, freight yards. Uh, if we want to jump down to energy, here's the electric power grid nationwide. We can go and zoom into any location. 
uh, click on a particular power plant, get the information about it. This is uh, natural gas, number of megawatts, that sort of thing. We can zoom in very close on a location. We can also grab the little satellite slider here and uh, we can go and see um, the plant itself. We have a number of uh, other infrastructure sectors here as well, but I think I'll skip that in the uh, spirit of brevity. We, these I tend to consider statics. In other words, we, we have these things pre-staged. We know what they are. They don't tend to go anywhere. We also have the ability to support dynamics. Now, the dynamics would be, for instance, a flood, a hurricane, or perhaps an earthquake. Uh, what I'd like to do now is show how we can go from cradle to grave, or in fact, from uh, data to decisions uh, right here and be able to disseminate that. Uh, let me uh, demonstrate that with an earthquake scenario, emphasized scenario, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Instead of pulling this down from the server, we can go and uh, let's just go from the beginning and show how we might be able to import this from a shapefile. So here is a zipped up shapefile. Let's go grab that, bring that in. It uh, assigns arbitrary colors to it. We can bring up the legend here and you can see the legend is now editable. Let's get rid of this. And so we can go and say Bay Area Quake. And we can go and add any text that we'd like to any of these uh, patches here or we can pull the values from uh, the shapefile itself. So this is uh, a number of damage areas from the not so bad area to the really bad area. Let's go and we can also change orders on these. So let's order this one. Here we go. And let's switch the labels back and let's go with green. And actually that's the red zone. Let's do red, orange, so we're symbolizing this thing right here on the fly. And pick a category name. I'm going to put this in test so I don't make a mess out of my good stuff. And we'll call it Bay Area Quake. We can upload that. Successfully uploaded. And now you can see that the uh, legend is no longer editable and is fully symbolized. The other thing that we can do with this is we can click on this report button and it will launch this report tab here. Let's go back. And it's performing the spatial intersection between these four zones and the electric power grid. And it should, there's the report there. It's gone and not only given us a list of the power plants and substations in each zone, but it also, it's also done an aggregation roll up. So we have for the four zones, we have a count of the number of power plants per zone and then a total and then similarly for a uh, capacity roll-up, we have megawatts broken down by fuel type and total of totals 3.6 gigawatts of power are at risk of this particular scenario. So these are the kinds of the capabilities that we can do across all infrastructures. Um, once uh, we, can, we can do this kind of analysis and visualize and browse this sort of information, but we can also go and add a title to the map. So here's Bay Area Quake. And let's go and add, uh, which is fully editable. We can also add a label. So let's go and say plants are damaged, something like that. So at this stage, not only do we have information and analysis, but with the titles and the labels, we can actually start to tell a story. And let's go and uh, we, of course, can relocate the legend anywhere we'd like. We have this application running on the iPad another browser, laptop over here, to uh, demonstrate the ability to share this stuff. So we've invented this notion called the channel. And it's not a single channel. It's an infinite number of channels. But well, let me just demonstrate it. That'll, I think, uh, that'll uh, push the meaning across. So we publish out to the channel. And for these applications that are monitoring the channel, these two iPads, the laptop over here, we've gone and just push this entire scenario out. Uh, and not just a picture of it, but a fully dynamic, interactive version of the application. We can go down here to the South Bay, maybe change the map up a little bit. Let's go and drop a different label in here. We'll say that these 
are undamaged. Uh, no damage. Or whatever uh, information you'd like to put on there. And we can then go and push this back out to the channel. And let's say that we're out in the field, we've made these changes, we can go and publish those things back. Push there, publish, we say yes. And now we have sent this map out to 1, 10, 100, 10,000 different iPads, web browsers, anywhere in the field worldwide. Infinite number of users, infinite number of concurrent channels, collaborating. Pretty cool, huh? Let's take a look at that again. Publish. Yes. And in theory, one, two, three, four, five. So here at Sandia, we primarily use this FastMap tool to analyze uh, and browse infrastructure. But we think that the channel capability could go far beyond uh, just the infrastructure and could be applied to any geospatial domain. And so that's why we wanted to share that with you. Um, thanks a lot. That's the demo. I appreciate you listening. Anyway, that uh, pretty much concludes what I had to show for today. Um, the um, Let's see. I think, again, uh, I wanted to just mostly show a few examples of the kinds of work that we do here, but uh, mostly just, uh, uh, I guess, bolster that we do have a pretty uh, capable geospatial team and some existing frameworks to build just about anything on. So if there's any interest, uh, I hope folks will think of us here at Sandia. Thank you so much, Leo. Um, I do want to be mindful of the time. We are running long, but we will continue and, and have our last two presenters. So um, for the folks who have joined today, if, if you can hang on uh, as we get closer to the hour, we would very much appreciate it. Um, next up, we have Richard Burnoff, who is our final speaker from Sandia National Laboratories, and he's going to walk us through the, the um, land fire tool. So Richard. Uh, can you hear me? I sure can. Oh, great. Well, thank you for inviting us. Uh, we have a project. Uh, the objective of our project is to demonstrate the societal benefits of remote sensing and other contemporary nat natural science data in wildfire management decisions. We've mapped this data into information to establish a value and use of the data in an actual application. As you can see, it's a very integrated team from all over the country and that uh, we have social scientists like myself, an economist, uh, ge a geologist, biologist, and a whole other ists. But anyway, next slide, please. The, the application that we have is with land fire that focuses on the distribution of land cover, water, and geologic characteristics across a regional landscape, such as the Sierra Nevada. And our study area here is on the right in California. That they, these attributes provide inputs for critical resource use prior to a wildfire that are redistributed post fire. The spatiotemporal risk analysis I'll be describing will be useful for short term mitigation and restoration decisions and for longer term strategic resource management and planning. The model is used in an example, the Rim Fire back in 2013 to assess trade offs, which means we have to net out how much of a particular critical resource we have and then how much it has been impacted to among the biophysical resources for natural hazards and critical infrastructure, and in the example in the Stanislaus National Forest. The model is used to estimate the value of the scientific information in a decision in the presence of uncertainty. This, this value helps identify how scientific information can be used by resource managers cost effectively. So in doing our assessment, we are looking at measuring wildfire benefits and risks, uh, as you can see, we, we apply a Bayesian network uh, in a, as a probabilistic causal model to establish exceedance probabilities. We utilize remote sensing 
uh, in particular Landsat and the uh, monitoring trend in burn severity data set. We uh, estimate the probability of habitat suitability. In this case, we looked at the California spotted owl, an endangered species, and also the California black bear, which is pretty ubiquitous up in the mountains. The forecast for post-fire impact is on natural hazards. We are looking at debris flows and floods, and also short and long-term impacts to water quality from erosion and sedimentation. As I have just said, we estimate exceeding probabilities of critical resource losses, and we estimate the economic benefits of forest mitigation or adaptation activities. Next slide. The study region, as, you, as I've mentioned, is in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, we, the region that we have data for is for the Stanislaus and the Sierra National Forests and also for Yosemite National Park and related BLM land. So we have interest at both the Department of Interior and the Department of Agriculture. We utilize the California spotted owl uh, classification. I'm going to just show you the spotted owl case that we have. Uh, it's based on the California Division the Department of Forest and, and Wildlife, Fisheries and Wildlife, sorry about that. Inputs from the land cover database and the wildfire data are in the green box to the left on the bottom row. What you see are the pre-map of the condition, the habitat suitability for the spotted owl on the left, which is in 2012, and on the right, which is in 2016. If you can make it out, you can see there is a change in some of the little red boxes on there that are the excellent areas for habitat suitability. Next slide. What we do is we take a look at the, in a retrospective analysis, the impacts of the rim fire, uh, and in this case on the California spotted owl. What you see on the left side is the MTBS or monitoring burn trends uh, transition of how severe the burn was from the rim fire that went from the Stanislaus into Yosemite National Park. On the right, what you have is what we consider what are the suitability transitions pre to post fire. And in some cases, we have an increase, and in some case, more cases, we have a decrease in the habitat suitability for the spotted owl. We look at two measures of risk, and one of the things that we use from macroeconomics is what is called the Lorenz curve. The Lorenz curve takes a population and distribute it according to how much of that population is at risk to whatever the disruption might be. And so what we have here in this graph is how much, uh, if we had perfect equality among the different categories in a uh, statistical distribution, we would have the 45 degree line on this graph. The more nonlinear this graph becomes, the more unequal or it, yeah, unequal the population is among its different uh, quantiles. So we measure two kinds of risk, two measures for a risk analysis. One is economic inequality, which is a me measurement of the distribution and redistribution of the economic benefits. And also we looked at biological inequality, measurement of the distribution of the habitat suitability. The impact is the redistribution. So the difference that we have before and after between years 2012 and 2016, we're using the land fire mapping tool, uh, and those were the two years that we had access to data, is that that change is showing that there's an increase in the equality economically. Well, we uh, next slide, please. What we did is we looked at the cost effectiveness of a hypothetical prescribed burn program. What's interesting is when we were doing the study, like I said, we found that there was an increase in the equality for the economic values. However, we found that, and we do have biologists on the project who said, wait a minute here, we want to save the best habitat. So we found that there was, if you had that as an objective, it was a minus. So that what we found in our cost effectiveness of the hypothetical prescribed burn is that we took an area, what this is, is this is the area of the rim fire 
and rank these the grid according to those conditional probabilities on the earlier regional maps and identified areas according to USDA that had um, areas of high suitability and had historical information that there were spotted owls or spotted owl territory nests, things like that in that particular area. So what we wanted to do was test a particular case study, which was to identify in that area A there on the map. Our grid, by the way, is one kilometer on the a one kilometer grid so that we are looking at decisions on the ground using the regional data that uh, is available to us. And as you can see, we, we tried to protect 16 high suitability quality cells, cost us $1.5 million to do it. We found that this, uh, there was a willingness to pay on the part of visitors that uh, for the for the suit for the habitat suitability, not the owls, since you cannot come up with a willingness to pay for California spotted owls, slightly under. So what we found is that that's a pretty good decision to go ahead with the prescribed burn, but that uh, it did have a slightly negative value. On the other hand, when we did the wild, uh, when we did the black bears, California black bears, what we found is that the economic value was not. And it was current is currently inestimable. In other words, that we did not have enough information to be able to categorize enough of the quantiles in the distribution. So what we do realize, though, is that there are co-located bears and owls, and that there would be a positive externality for the owl from the owl habitat protection that could improve the situation for black bears. Next slide. Now, what we're doing in, in order to add in some of the issues that are associated with what I've been hearing about today is that we have all these different type of cultural resources and we have things like pipelines, transmission lines, all going through the area where the rim fire happened. And in fact, we found that there was an area that a debris flow could have impacted a powerhouse and transmission lines at the bottom of a sub uh, sub watershed. In fact, it was the home powerhouse for San Francisco water power and sewer uh, for the uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. In addition, we've added in uh, sediment yield, all the different kinds of dynamics that happen that are the result of the burn severity. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So the integrated model that we're looking at is decisions about mitigation versus adaptation. So we have resource trade-offs in the sense of natural resources, engineered infrastructure, decision-making priorities that are subject to budget and time constraints. So what we looked at was mitigation for pre-fire treatments. As I've described, we have the California spotted owl habitat and bear habitat. And we also have the natural, some natural and cultural resources. We do know that there were some archeological sites uh, that were affected by the fire. And that uh, in the case of the adaptation, we have post-fire treatments where we're using uh, the uh, infrastructure, to determine infrastructure impacts, Kinneros 2, the Agua, tool that was developed by the Agricultural Research Service, and that we are also looking at community resilience in terms of impacted reservoirs, such as in Modesto, California. The other aspect of what we're doing, as I mentioned earlier, is that there is this question of the value of the scientific information that's being used, the remote sensing, and whether or not it makes sense to continually update the science. We will be producing uh, a, a report on all of this. Next slide. And uh, basically, this is a very quick demonstration of what we're doing. Uh, our project is uh, trying to, like I said, work on mitigation versus adaptation decisions and to minimize the losses of what could be done ahead of time. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Richard. So now we've reached our final presentation of the day from Alona Tiber from SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. She is going to be discussing the Grid Resil Resilience and Intelligence Platform. Alona, thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this webinar today. Um, my name is Lona Tiber, and I will be presenting the um, GRIP project, which is a joint effort from OE and CEDO under the GMLC. Um, so let's get started. And next slide. Thank you. Um, so GRIP takes a machine learning and a data-driven approach to grid resilience uh, by breaking the problem down into three components. So the first one being anticipation of extreme grid events, uh, absorption using controls of DERs and flexible resources, and recovery by managing DERs in the case of limited communication. So overall, uh, we've developed a platform and metrics that capture the grid resilience given an extreme event. We are able to run multi-time scale simulations, such as multi-month planning studies, multi-week PSPS mitigation strategies, and uh, day of events during operation. So GRIP features IT and OT system integration to reduce the impacts of extreme events, uh, specifically during communication loss and features a sophisticated UI, um, which is ready to use by both experienced and inexperienced users. Um, and lastly, I want to mention that this work could not be completed without our dedicated team and knowledgeable tag as on the right here. And um, so next slide. So um, to put GRIP in the context of wildfires, I'd like to dig a little deeper into the three modules. So um, anticipation models the electrical likelihood of failure, uh, line vegetation contacts using LIDAR and GIS data, and uh, PSPS optimization analytics. Uh, absorption is broken down into three parts. Um, so first, fault isolation, then virtual island information um, given that fault, and power balancing using DERs and flexible loads. Um, and lastly, there is recovery module, which features a fast anomaly detection, machine learning, image processing for pole failure and transmission black start. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, the anticipation module develops a grid asset vulnerability metric that essentially captures the effects of extreme wind on electrical poles. GRIP also uses California Forest Observatory GIS and LIDAR data, as shown in the figure on the right, to develop a vegetation contact estimation on the lines themselves. The data has a three meter resolution, um, which, which is coupled with grid models, weather data, geographical topology, and equipment data, which all come together uh, to give the ability for GRIP to forecast the risk and extent of fault propagation on the distribution network. Um, furthermore, anticipation features a PSPS analytics component that um, has the objective of maintaining maximum load under wildfire risk. The analytics produce a selective de-energization de of system components to mitigate wildfires. Next slide. Uh, so next we have um, absorption. And um, so the goal is to avoid load loss given a fault upstream of the network. So this allows utilities to better prepare for their net, uh, prepare their network um, to serve load post loss of the bulk grid. The idea behind um, this is to identify the fault location and reconfigure the system into smaller islands supported by DRs, flexible load, and slack bus. So um, as you see here on the right, we have a highly simplified example to illustrate the algorithm on an 11 node system. So each one of these nodes is considered a super node with hundreds of customers on each node. So next, um, on the next slide here, um, we introduce a fault due to a fire on node one and 102. Um, node one is the bulk grid. So on the next slide, you see that the entire um, that the entire network has been blacked out. Um, so this, this event triggers a set of switching actions that isolate the bulk grid 
and uh, node 102 as seen on the next slide. The nodes are isolated and the rest of the distribution network is supported by batteries, solar, or flexible loads such as uh, HVACs and water heaters. Um, this, algor this algorithm was expanded to a large scale test on a real Vermont um, electric co-op distribution feeder. And the results showed that the unserved energy reduction went from 100% to 10% using GRIP. Um, so the flexible load controls were tested and validated on 150 uh, residential water heaters installed in uh, Vermont homes that feature the GRIP control system. So on the next slide, um, I'll dig into some of the analytics that we have for recovery. So the recovery analytics introduced the ability to detect anomalies. There's the results using machine learning achieved near perfect identification of theft and hardware failures from the same meter test and training data. Um, fast anomaly detection was implemented as well for real-time detection during these operations. Um, GRIP also developed analytics that ingest video data and with the help of machine learning was able to de define the pull tilt and the failures. Um, additionally, recovery module contains analytics that assist with transmission black start that determine the optimal sequence for de-energizing generators and switch operations to restore power and transmission networks. So uh, on the next slide, um, I'd like to go over um, GRIP's integration with other tools and deployment. Uh, GRIP is designed with technology agnostics in mind. So the platform integrated with data sharing tools such as uh, OpenFIDO uh, is able to implement SIM converters and equipment library conversions for ease of use with GRIP. The tools also uh, support on-premise and cloud deployment such as GCP. And um, I'd like to mention that GRIP uses an agent-based power flow solver um, called HiPass GridLab D with um, a pre-commercial level solver capable of large-scale studies of distribution network analysis. Um, additionally, NRECA as our key partner has integrated GRIP's analytics into their OMF co-op platform that hosts users from over 176 utilities, vendors, and universities nationwide that are using the GRIP analytics right now. Um, we are currently deploying GRIP's resilience analytics with the California IOU, um, which is facing wildfire risks that GRIP aims to assist with. Um, and lastly, GRIP deployed 150 thermostatically controlled devices uh, with the absorption algorithm that was able to effectively test and validate the controls for the resilience use cases. So um, on the next slide, um, I'd like to uh, thank you for listening and uh, the Department of Energy for support with our project. Um, if you'd like to collaborate, deploy, or help test our tools, please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, at the email listed here. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Alona, and to all of our panelists. This was fantastic information, and thank you to everyone who has uh, remained on as we have gone a little bit over time. Um, we want to conduct one more poll. This time we'd like to know, based on what you've heard today, do you plan now to talk to somebody from DOE or the National Labs about technologies to help mitigate wildfires? Um, and so while we have run short on time, we are not going to be able to get to the questions. We are going to review them with our presenters today and try to share some of them on the webinar series website in the coming days. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to, to our speakers for your time and energy. Um, we are going to post a PDF of today's presentation on the website by Monday, along with a recording that should be available later next week. And if you haven't already done so, please do register for our final webinar next Thursday, April 29th from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, our speakers are going to be focusing on modeling and analytic tools and post-fire analysis with our speakers from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it and have a wonderful day.